Good evening, Mr. and Ms. Internet and all our ships at sea. Man, man, man. Roger Moore. Roger Moore. So, yeah. You know, it's funny. Moore was... He, he was, I mean, it was a fantastic actor, one. He, he was a great actor. He, he did a lot of great roles outside of James Bond. Um, the interesting thing about Moore, as he pertains to Bond, though, is he was the... I mean, I suppose he's probably the most universally reviled of the actors who played Bond. And I have to say, it's... I really can't say it's because of his acting. It's more the scripts that he was working with. Um, it was the 70s. It was the 70s, and in the you know by the 80s it was a little bit old hat, but it was definitely the 70s. He was definitely a product of the 70s. Um, you know, he, he came into uh, came into Live and Let Die was 70. I think it was 73 that he did Live and Let Die. Um, he was a cool Bond. Like, Roger Moore played Bond well. And in fact, you know, some of his movies are among my very favorites. In fact, um, For Your Eyes Only is my favorite Bond film because I, I feel like it's a real, so, real sort of... Uh, James Bond, Cold War, spy, thriller kind of story. It doesn't go too crazy with the gadgets. It actually... I love the fact that they literally blow up the car. Spoiler alert, they blow up the car at the very beginning of the movie, and he pretty much does the whole movie without any sort of gadgets. Um, nothing like real significant anyway. The, the kind of stuff they use. He doesn't really get issued much from Q Branch. He's got his little video watch that he had in the other movie. Um, what, the Spy Who Loved Me. He's got his little video watch. That was a little cheeky joke in The Spy Who Loved Me. Uh, but the only gadgets that Bond uses they, they use this identigraph, which is basically like a, uh, oh, sort of a, uh, a computerized version of a police sketch artist, which was kind of a cool concept uh, back then. It, it was facial, facial recognition, facial identification uh, software before that really existed. It was very much a science fiction-y sort of thing at the time. Uh, but the concept was there. Uh, and he was able to, to put in all the different parameters and the computer would kind of come up with this sort of a vague sketch of the person of interest and then they would, you know, search the databases and, and uh, do facial recognition algorithms. Magic. Bond magic. Bond gadget magic. And, and then spit out a, an identity. Um, which was cool. And... I think it was very telling. It was very, uh, it was very purposeful that they they blew up the car from the spy who They blew up the Lotus at the very beginning. Of the movie. Uh, they, you know, destroyed it, and uh, he's forced to do the, the sort of James Bond esque uh, chase scene. Uh, I forgot what kind of car that was. It was some terrible little Italian car. So, Before Your Eyes Only was a brilliant, brilliant film. It, it hands down my favorite of the series. Um, above Casino Royale, above all of Sean Connery's movies, uh, above Dr. No, above Thunderball even, um, Thunderball from Russia with Love, above, not by much, not by much, mind you, especially from Russia with Love, because that was not a gadget-centric movie either. Uh, but uh, 
certainly my favorite of the Bond films uh, for reasons in that it was very much a Cold War story. It was very much a, a realistic sort of story, uh, and it sort of eschewed the traditional Bond uh, kind of tropes with the ridiculous gadgets and the over-the-top action and the silly stunts and all that kind of stuff. Um, that's that's really what did it for me with that movie. It really, really uh, solidified that. And it didn't help that, or, or, or of course, it, I mean, not to mention, I shouldn't say, it didn't help. It, 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 of course it helped. Uh, it may have helped that that was... That was the Bond movie I was exposed to the most as a kid. So, like, that was the one that really stood out in my childhood and really solidified uh, my psyche, my young psyche as, as a Bond fan. Uh, and that movie really had it all. That was, that was, a, that was I mean, that was a high bar to set for the Bond, I mean, for any, 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 any uh, following Bond films, very high bar to set, you had literally everything, you had, uh, the only, the only things you were really missing were the, the ridiculous gadgets, which I was never a huge fan of the ridiculous gadgets, because I always felt they were kind of a cop-out, um, especially, see, especially in the, the Brosnan films, with the Brosnan film, they really felt like a cop-out because he had the exact gadget he needed at the exact right time, which is sort of dumb. Uh, but we're not talking about uh, Chris Brosnan today, we're talking about Sir Roger Moore and his uh, legacy as James Bond. And, uh, Moore was cool, you know, he, that was my favorite film of his, his tenure, so we have the series. Um, Live and Let Die was okay. Um, Live and Let Die was not a bad Bond. It was a little campy, it was a little dumb. Um, especially with this whole, like, it was very much the 70s, it was very much a war on drugs sort of thing, even though the war on drugs wasn't a, really a thing yet. The War on Drugs Bond movie was definitely License to Kill. That was that was the War on Drugs movie. So we won't really go into that. Uh, but it, it was, you know, very much a. a it, it felt a lot like a black exploitation film. Uh, it, it kind of. Very much inspired by that black exploitation uh, genre uh, that was really coming into its own at the time. With Superfly, and Shaft, and, uh, uh, I keep wanting to say Jackie Brown, but Jackie Brown was much later. It wasn't really a true black exploitation film. It was more like Quentin Tarantino's uh, interpretation of a black exploitation film. Um, I'm gonna get you sucker. Uh, those movies. That was. That's really what Live and Let Die was heavily inspired by. Uh, yeah, for better or worse. Um, uh, so it was. It was an okay film. Uh, you know, Jane Seymour was kind of cool, and as a Bond girl, she was very much a, a damsel in distress the whole time. She really. She was not Bond's equal by any means. And I think that's why I really liked uh, For Your Eyes Only 2, is because it, it really, the Bond girl in that, um, Melina, I'm trying to remember her last name. Uh, 
of the franchise of the other Bond girls, uh, in that she was she was feisty, like she was good at what she did, uh, which was killing people. Um, uh, you know, she wasn't she was not a special agent by any means. She was a woman motivated by revenge, uh, but she was you know for being. Not a professional killer. She was pretty darn good at killing people with a crossbow, uh, which was cool. Like I love the crossbow thing. Uh, a little creepy that she was like 20 years younger than Bond at the time. Which by the time we got to the 80s, that's kind of what it turned out. It turned into. Uh, Bond was in his let's see, 89. 30 something years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, so he was in his 50s uh, in, the seven, er, in the 80s. He was definitely in his 50s. He was definitely getting a little over the hill there uh, to play James Bond by the 80s. Uh, but, you know, she, you know, uh, Carol, God, what is her name? She was like late 20s, so he's like 20 or 30 years older than her. <laughs> it's like, a little creepy. Um, let's see, Jim. That was what got a little ridiculous for me, especially towards, like, at least with the view to a kill, um, the view to a kill, the, uh, the Bond girl, uh, Stacy Summers, I think was her name. Uh, I cannot remember the actress. So terrible. Uh, I'm a terrible Bond geek. I cannot remember the actress. Uh, but uh, yeah, like she was like in her. I'm giving the benefit of the doubt. Say she was in her early 30s, maybe early 30s. Um, but it was just that was a weird movie. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, but. Live and Let Die was, was interesting. It wasn't a bad Bond film, but it wasn't one of the better ones. It was just kind of middling. Um, it, it was mediocre. It was on par with, say, Quantum of Solace. It was on par with... Uh, uh, it was on par with Tomorrow Never Dies. Um, which is one of my... It's a, that's one of my favorites, by the way. It's not a great Bond film, but it is definitely one of my favorites. I just enjoy it. Uh, for reasons. Uh, but, um... Yeah, it's just, you know, it wasn't it wasn't one of the best. It wasn't one of the worst. It, Thunderball uh, was one of the sort of the middle, mid-range uh, Bond movies. Diamonds Are Forever is kind of a kind of a middle range Bond movie. Um, and you know, as much people much as people keep grief to it, um, the plot at least of Honor Majesty Secret Service was kind of like middle range. Like execution wise was eh, there's parts that are a little I don't like, but you know, overall it's kind of a not terrible. People don't like that because they don't like George Lazenby, but whatever. Uh, he, he did okay. He did okay. But, you know, we're talking about Sir Roger Moore. We're not going to call anybody else. Um, the Man with the Golden Gun was horrid. Uh, I, I really don't like that one. Uh, I think it's, it's too campy. It's too over the top. It's too dumb. Why the hell Sheriff J.W. Pepper was in Thailand uh, is beyond me. Like, that whole chase sequence with him was just stupid. Like, he was a goofy little side character in Live and Let Die. I'll give you that. He was a good comic relief, and he, he helped to sort of establish a sense of place, a sense of setting in New Orleans, in Louisiana. Uh, 
but to put him to drop him into uh, to drop him into uh, the man with the golden gun to drop him into Thailand as a tourist and he meets up with Bond just haphazardly that just ugh. there's not much I like about this movie um, Christopher Lee as as the bad guy as Scaramanga that's one of the few things I like about this film. Um, you know, Roger Moore is being Roger Moore as James Bond, and that's fine. Um, that's all fine, well, and good. But the, the whole film, like, uh, Mary Goodnight, and, uh, you know, she was a terrible character. Just a screeching damsel in distress. She was Willie from Temple of Doom. Just terrible, terrible screeching woman that just was annoying and set women back another 20 years. That portrayal, that character, she just was not a positive character at all. Um, the big stunt set piece for that, uh, the big chase scene, Live and I Die had a great chase scene too. Why, why, why would I not mention this? That that freaking boat chase on the bayou was phenomenal. Oh my god, that was a set piece. That was a brilliant, brilliant uh, chase sequence and set piece. And um, to try and follow that up, um, to try and follow that up with the with the little canoe chase in uh, Man with the Golden Gun, and then that that silly-ass car chase in uh, Man with the Golden Gun, where he's in the AMC Pacer, um, and he's chasing Scaramanga and uh, uh, Knickknack, Kirby Vanche. I can never pronounce his last name because it's French. I can't pronounce it very well. Herb, Herb Villain. Villain Vanchel, I can't remember. Somebody drop me a comment in the doobly doo and let me know how to pronounce his name because I keep, if I can read it, I might be able to pronounce it okay, but just off the top of my head, um, I cannot think, I cannot think of how to pronounce, because I can't picture it. I can't picture the letters in the right order, so I just lose it. Um, but he's knickknack, or he's tattooed. He's the little French guy. Uh, who was apparently like super ridiculous horn dog because he had like prostitutes on set and all that kind of stuff when he was when he was working on that film. Um, that movie was just sort of the ridiculous epitome of 70s James Bond and it was terrible. Uh, it was all kinds of terrible. Uh, moving on. Um, Man with the Golden Gun into... That was 75, so we're up to 70, 77, uh, Spy Who Loved Me. Spy Who Loved Me was okay. It was another kind of middle-of-the-road James Bond movie. It was interesting in that he was forced to work with sort of his, his opposite in the KGB, Agent Triple X. Agent Triple X. It's like, oh my god, really? Really? We're going over the top with the Fleming-esque cheeky names here. Uh, Agent Triple X. And Triple X happened to be like a new rating. That that was like the year that the Triple X rating debuted. Uh, 77, 76, 77. Um, so they were making fun of that, of course. Uh, the, but the movie, the plot wasn't terrible. It was an interesting sort of thing where um, James Bond with him as MI6 and, uh, and uh, Major... Uh, Barbara Bach was the actress. Not Catherine Bach. Not Catherine Bach uh, from Dukes of Hazzard. Not Daisy Duke. Barbara Bach, another amazingly beautiful 70s, 70s hot, 70s hot. Um, 
Barbara Bach. Um, she was a uh, major, I want to say major Asimova, but I cannot, it, it just escapes me. Um, the plot was very, it was big and bombastic and ridiculous. It was very much uh, a throwback to the Blofeld era megalomaniacal plots that would define the series later, especially in the Brosnan era. Um, and it was sort of what defined the series early on with Spectre, uh, except it just wasn't Spectre, it was just this one guy. Um, which sort of took away some of the credibility of it. Um, like, from what I understand, um, Stromberg, Carl Stromberg, who was the, the antagonist in that movie, he was supposed to be Ernst Stauffer of Blofeld. That was supposed to be the It was supposed to be Blofeld. Blofeld was supposed to get away at the end of uh, For Your Eyes Only. No, sorry. Going back to For Your Eyes Only. He was supposed to get away at the end of, of uh, Diamonds Are Forever. He's supposed to get away, which he does, he does, but he was supposed to be the bad guy in the end. Yeah. Spider loved me. And for some reason, they just didn't want to make him Blofeld. I mean, uh, he could have been Blofeld. I mean, they easily could have cast that guy as Blofeld. Um, Kurt Jurgens. Uh, could have cast him as Blofeld, but um, he would have made, you know, he'd been okay. Yeah, they probably would have had a dub a lot of his lines, because I think he was dubbed in that movie. It was like Gert Fro uh, as Gert Fro in uh, Goldfinger was actually speaking English, but his accent was so ridiculously thick, nobody could understand him, and they went back and dubbed him. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, the Bond series is... I, I love the Bond series. I, I'm, a, I'm a nut for it. Um, I used to be way more into the trivia than I am. I for, I've probably forgotten more trivia uh, than most people will ever know about James Bond. Uh, unless, you're, uh, unless you're Robin Richards. Um, yeah, because Robin Richards is probably the only person I know who knows as much about James Bond as I do. Or maybe, maybe Barbara Broccoli, but I don't know. I don't know Barbara Broccoli personally, so I can't tell you. Anyway, um, yeah, Robin and I always had a, a rivalry over who knew more about James Bond. It was sort of this weird, like, trivia nerd rivalry. Um, but anyway, um, anyway, so, um, so that was the spy who loved me. The, the really cool, the parachute jump at the beginning of the movie. He, he skis off the cliff because there's the, the the ski chase, which was really cool. Um, love a good ski chase. We haven't seen it, you know, at that point we hadn't seen a ski chase since on a match to Secret Service. Uh, it was really well done. It was really well shot. Um, and then, of course, he jumps off and the parachute opens up and it's the Union Jack, which was, I mean, the you think about it and it's like that's a dumb idea because you're a secret agent and you're not they're not the other side is not supposed to know who is doing this but that's like a big middle finger at the Cold War like ha 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 the West has bested you ha ha of course the, the parachute unfurls it's the Union flag um and da -da -ba -da -ba -da -da. and uh you know into the opening sequence Maurice Bender opening titles. Um, so that was a, it was fun. It had a lot of really exotic, really exotic locales, uh, which was really cool. It was very much a, an exotic sort of travelogue Bond movie, uh, which is part of the Bond genre. Uh, I wrote a piece, and I am I'm of the opinion that Bond is its own genre. Um, there are other movies that are not James Bond in the James Bond genre, uh, but James Bond definitely established 
a new type of film, a new genre of film. It does have generic conventions, it has generic tropes. Um, I wrote a piece on the, the generic conventions of James Bond and why it exists as its own genre. I, uh, my my uh, film class in college, I did a film class, and it was genre study. Of course, the, the, the whole thing was leading up to this term paper uh, at, in taking uh, one of the generic films we watched in class and defining that as exemplary of its genre. And I, I asked the professor, I'm like, you know what? I'm a huge nut for this kind of stuff. I think that this thing, uh, it followed, you know, and I, I, I pled my case and she was like, go for it, go for it. Let me know what you, uh, let me know what you think. And, and, I went into the uh, I went into that final paper because it was a it was a series of papers uh, that was those were our grades I don't think I don't think we had any exams I think it was just the papers um, I went into it I think I went into that with a D in the class and I came out with an A in the class so I uh, must have done something right. It's not the best, you know, in hindsight, looking back, it's not the best paper, but I think I made my case. It wasn't the best written paper, you know, rhetorically speaking, it wasn't the best uh, writing. It's certainly not my best example of writing. Uh, but I think the, the points were strong enough, I think, that uh, that worked. Uh, of course, it probably helped out, you know, as a freshman taking this uh, junior level class. Into it with a D. I don't think it was mathematically possible unless I got over a hundred on the paper. I don't know what my final grade on that paper was. I just know what my final grade in the class was, and it was like a 93 or something like that. I went in with a D. Um, it's sad to say, I went into a I went into a final with a D. I, it took me into college. It took me until college to go into a class to go into a final with a D. How much the education system failed me. Uh, I never had to work for anything until I got to college. Uh, anyway, so uh, that was my luck, and it, it sort of had this weird like thing where Bond like killed Bond killed her lover or her boyfriend or her husband or something. And then it ends up, she ends up with Bond, in bed with Bond, and it was just, it's, it was weird. And so there was a lot of weird sexual tension in that movie. It was interesting, it was different, it was neat to see that. But, I, you know, I gotta chalk it up to being a, a, a piece of its time period. It was just a odd, a little cringy, um, the way it was played. But it had Jaws. Uh, Richard Keel as Jaws was just fantastic. Um, classic, classic character. He's only in two movies. Um, but he makes more sense, you know, coming back in the second movie than, than J.W. Pepper made sense coming back in the second movie. Because at least Jaws, with Jaws, Jaws is a henchman. Um, Jaws is a henchman. He's just a hired gun. And so it would make sense that the bad guy hires him as muscle, you know. Which leads us into the next movie, Moonraker. Um, quite possibly the worst of the series. So, like, my favorite of the entire series. Uh, a bunch of middling films. And, in my opinion, the... No, I'm sorry, it is not the worst anymore. That's right. Die Another Day is the absolute worst of the series. Um, Moonraker is probably the second worst of the series. <laughs> Until Die Another Day came out, Moonraker was the worst. Uh, Moonraker is terrible. Uh, there, that's all I can say about it. It's absolutely stupid and terrible. There is nothing about James Bond. There is nothing about this movie that is really even remotely redemptive, except maybe Jaws. Um, 
the jokes were cring the, the jokes were kind of cheeky and funny. A little cringy, but what's he doing? I believe he's attempting re-entry, sir. Oh my goodness. Um, Dr. Holly Goodhead. Um, yeah, they were just not trying at this point. Um, yeah, terrible, terrible movie. Terrible idea, or a terrible movie based on a, a not so great idea from a from one of the weaker James Bond books. Um, Moonraker was James Bond in space, and it was like, hey, we have this new sh space shuttle technology. What if we use it in a Bond movie? Oh shit, it's 1979 and Star Wars is kicking our asses. What are we gonna do? Let's put him in space. Space and science fiction and lasers. That's the new thing. Space Marines. This is br brilliant. It's a, it, it is absolutely a, it is a, uh, what Doug Walker calls a chart movie. It, it, it is absolutely formulaic, boom, 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 boom. These are the things that test well with audiences right now, so throw them in a movie. You know, space and, and, and science fiction-y things and blasters and lasers and uh, technology and cheeky jokes and neo-Nazism. Wait, neo not What? Anyway. Moonraker. Um... Jaws tested well with audiences in the previous movie. Let's bring Jaws back in. Let's put him in there. Um, just, just a shitty chart movie. Um, nothing really else can be said about it. Uh, so 78. I think it was 78, actually. So right on the heels of Star Wars. Um, 78 or 79. It was, I think it was 78. I want to say that one was 78, and Spy Let Me was 76. But, yeah, they're roughly two years apart, all of them. Uh, For Your Eyes Only, I know, is 1980. I'm pretty sure it's 1980. Maybe 81. So I may be, I may be 79, 81. What is it? Eyes Only, and then Octopus is 83. So, uh, yeah, For Your Eyes Only is 81. Octopus is 83. Um, and then a View to a Kill is 85. So they're all two years apart. Um, so, yeah. So, Free Rise Only, then. You know, we're skipping, skipping most of Moonraker because it's painful to remember. Uh, Free Rise Only uh, really brought it back. And I think that's why it is what it is. It's... It, it was definitely a response to the just over-the-top stupidity of Moonraker. We wanted to literally get James Bond back to Earth. Um, get rid of the gadgets, get rid of the nonsense, get rid of the stupidity. We're just going to have a good, solid Cold War story. Cold War spy thriller. And it worked. It, and that's what it was. It was a mystery and a thriller, and it worked for the James Bond uh, franchise. It really, I would hazard to say it uh, saved the franchise from termination. So, uh, enough about that. I've already talked at length about that film. Then we jump into Octopussy. Octopussy was another sort of weird mystery, sort of, uh, let's find out what's going on. Getting to be more about electronics and things like that, uh, and then of course it was uh, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm, th I'm thinking of Peter Kill. Um, Octopus. It was another another solid Cold War story. It was uh, it was very much uh, a, uh, a rogue Russian general uh, wants to get NATO. He wants to kind of build a bigger buffer. He's tired of detente. Uh, so he plans to set off a nuclear device at a U.S. Air Force Base, Rammstein Air Force Base, uh, and 
destabilize NATO say, and get European sympathies on the side of the Soviets, get the nuclear weapons out of Europe, and so that the Soviets can have a more of a buffer zone and more control of the area. Uh, great story. Not the best execution, but really good stunt work, fantastic set pieces, the big fight on the side of the airplane, um, the, um, and then of course the skydive fight, uh, harking back to a little bit of um, uh, The Spy Who Loved Me, and uh, just, a, just a good film. I just didn't like where James Bond was putting on clown makeup, because I don't like clowns. Um, I sort of thought that that was indicative of how people viewed um, how people viewed Roger Moore as James Bond. So, eh, but yeah. And finally, Vito Kill, Christopher Walken as the bad guy, absolutely brilliant. Um, kind of a weird plot, not very plausible. Cool chase scene with uh, with the fire truck in San Francisco. Grace Jones as a Bond girl. Okay. Weird. Weird. Um, cool story. Uh, it worked. And it was it was a strong send-off uh, for, uh, for Roger Moore. It was a good last entry. It was a far better last entry than Pierce Brosnan. Um, so at least it's got that going for him. That's that's Bond. That's Roger Moore's Bond. Uh, honorable mention. I do need to talk. Uh, I need, do need to at least mention. Uh, I do need to at least mention Cannonball Run, which was f***ing brilliant uh, as a um, as a spoof <laughs> with Roger Moore. Roger Moore playing Roger Moore playing James Bond. That in and of itself is a reason to watch this film. If you have not seen The Cannonball Run, please go and watch it. Um, Star-studded cast, uh, Burt Reynolds, Don DeLuise, just being Burt Reynolds and Don DeLuise, uh, along with um, with uh, Jackie Chan playing a Chinese man, uh, which is weird. No, sorry, no, Jackie Chan is Chinese. Japanese. Gosh, it's been a long day. Uh, Jackie Chan playing a Japanese man, which is weird. Um, uh, and then, of course, Roger Moore as Roger Moore as James Bond. And the way he handles it just shows the depth of character he has. It, 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 you can watch this film and tell he was having a lot of fun playing this character in this film. Uh, great actor. Um... Uh, Another honorable mention for, for Sir Roger Moore uh, was Boat Trip. Was it, was it called Boat Trip? It was the one with Cuba Gooding Jr. and the fat white guy, and they go on the cruise uh, that turns out to be like a gay cruise, like a gay singles cruise, and they meet James Bond, and he plays like this like retired SAS trooper who happens to be gay, and it was hilarious. And I, I watched that film at a time and it really overcame a lot of stereotypes, and I thought that was really brilliant. Um, so, it, it, I think that movie did a lot, at least for me, uh, to uh, sort of build that, that respect um, of, of other people, you know, of gay people, to sort of like promote an understanding and say, hey, you know, they're just regular people, you know, they can be regular people too, which was a big deal. Um, it was a big deal in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, that was, that was, you know, it was still a new thing. What the hell are you guys doing? It was still very much a new thing um, to, uh, to do something like that. Um, anyway, so honorable mention to, to, I believe it's Boat Trip. Um, check it out, uh, Cannibal Run, definitely, and of course the you know the more Bond movies. Um, and that's that's all I've really got for today. Uh, check me out, follow along on Twitter uh, at Airborne Surfer. Of course, AirborneSurfer.com is where everything is, and at YouTube.com/slash/TheAirborneSurfer. My name is Atari. 
This has been the Freeway Forum. Thank you for watching, and until next time, tally ho, y'all.